Hey everybody, welcome back to Investing with Wesley. In today's episode, I'm gonna tell you about the new interest rate that we're gonna be transitioning to from LIBOR into this rate. The new rate is called the SOFR rate. Let's get into it. So if you guys remember me talking about the LIBOR rate in the video up above, then you'll know that there was a lot of speculation on whether or not the LIBOR rate was being manipulated because like I said, it was basically just somebody on the phone calling other banks and asking them what rate they would lend or borrow money from a bank in a different country. It was as easy as calling up your buddy in Japan or calling your buddy in Australia and saying, hey, make sure you tell this guy it's 2% because of X, Y, and Z. So it was really easy to manipulate the LIBOR rate. So because of that, they got rid of the LIBOR rate and instead are introducing the SOFR rate. Now the SOFR rate stands for Secured Overnight Financing Rate. Now just like the name implies, this rate is a secured rate, whereas LIBOR was an unsecured rate. And the secured or unsecured really just breaks down to collateralized. As an example, if you have very low credit or no credit at all because you're just starting out, you may have to get a secured credit card. And that is you give the credit card company X amount of money and that will be your credit limit. The limit you have is already secured by the deposit you made. Whereas an unsecured credit card, or in this case an unsecured rate, it is just based on good faith and your credit score. Now when we get into LIBOR and SOFR, obviously it is way more complicated than that, but you have to remember that LIBOR is unsecured and that SOFR is secured. And the reason that these people decided to go from LIBOR to SOFR is because they knew that LIBOR wasn't based on transactions, but it was based on opinions at face value. Whereas SOFR is derived from transactions, so it is very easy to track and make sure it's not being manipulated as easily as the LIBOR rate could have been. So when I say that the SOFR rate is based on transactions, well, what transactions are they based on? The transactions that happen in the United States repo market are the basis for the SOFR rate. The SOFR rate moves in conjunction with the US repo rate. Now, if you're curious on what the repo market is or how it works, I explained it a little bit in my last episode, but just for your convenience, I'll put a replay up on screen. The repo market doesn't stand for like repossession as far as like someone not paying their loans and that kind of stuff. When I say repo market, I'm actually talking about the treasury repurchasing market. And basically how the repo market works are extremely short term deals, usually a day to three days, but definitely no more than 30 days. And basically what happens in the repo market is that banks will make a deal with financial institutions and hedge funds where the banks trade money for treasury bonds or treasury bills as collateral. That way the hedge funds and the financial institutions can use that money to make some sort of deal in an extremely short amount of time. And let's say after three days, the hedge funds or financial institutions will give that money plus a little bit of interest back to the bank. And the bank will give the treasury bills or the treasury bonds back to the hedge funds or financial institutions. It's basically a really quick trade so financial institutions and hedge funds have a little bit more capital to invest and capitalize on really good deals happening right this second. And that in short is the repo market. Now because the SOFR rate is secured and the LIBOR rate is not, this in theory means that the SOFR rate would be even lower of an interest rate than the LIBOR rate. Because whether it's a loan, credit card, it doesn't matter, anytime you're dealing with lending and interest rates, secured is always going to be lower than unsecured. And when it comes to operating this country's economy and carrying all the massive debt loads we have, the lower the interest rate, the better. In case you already didn't know, the US economy and the Federal Reserve both operate out of debt. And it's a lot deeper than the government spending more than they bring in in taxes. How our economy actually functions is one man's debt is another man's salary. And when that salary goes up, they're able to take on more debt and thus become someone else's salary and someone else's salary and so on and so forth. And that's how the economic circle works, as well as it is stimulated based on the GDP and how much goods we produce. But in order to produce those goods, businesses have to take on debt and expand. So it all goes back into the inevitable cycle of debt to income and income to debt. But you're not the US and you're not the US economy by yourself, you just contribute to it. So how does this actually affect you? Well, because the US and the Federal Reserve need to keep borrowing money and everyone else basically just needs to keep borrowing money to stimulate the economy, that's exactly what they're shooting for. 
With the SOFA rate being a secured interest rate and not an unsecured, like I mentioned before, it lowers the interest rate when compared to LIBOR because it's secured. And obviously the lower interest rate, the cheaper it is to borrow money, meaning the easier it is to take on more debt. So if it's really cheap to borrow money and it's really easy to take on more debt, in theory, the Federal Reserve is assuming you're going to put that debt to good use, stimulating the economy and continuing this debt cycle over and over and over again. And in theory, this works great because it is cheaper to borrow money and businesses will use that money to expand and obviously produce a bigger profit for themselves. But as businesses expand and produce more profit, they need extra help. Thus, more jobs are created so more people can work and take care of themselves and put that money into goods that other businesses produce, thus circulating the money supply in the economy. So this all sounds great. With the SOFA rate, we get rid of the manipulation. It's a lower rate, which means it's easier to borrow money and it's easier to stimulate the economy. It could mean more jobs and so on and so forth. At the surface level, this new SOFA rate sounds incredible. And you have to remember how it affects you directly is the SOFA rate is going to replace LIBOR. So everything that LIBOR was attached to, the SOFA rate will be attached to now as well. So things like mortgages, credit cards, auto loans, student loans, derivatives, you name it, everything that the LIBOR rate is attached to, the SOFA rate will be attached to it instead. That's why in my opinion, the SOFA rate is an extremely important rate to pay attention to because it affects you directly as well as indirectly. It affects you indirectly because it goes towards commercial banks and businesses that are borrowing money at very low interest rates, but it also affects you directly because as the SOFA rate goes up or down, so will things like your mortgage, your student loans, and anything that's not at a fixed rate. Now, if you listen closely, you might've heard me say things like surface level and in theory. And this is because there is one giant problem with the SOFA rate being attached to the United States repo market. And when I say giant, I mean absolutely giant. If we are not careful, the SOFA rate being connected to the United States repo rate can literally cripple the United States economy in a blink of an eye. But to learn more about how that works and if that's coming or not, look out for my next video because in the next video, I talk to you all about that. Until our next episode, have a good one.